about some baking myths and other BS you just should not believe. Number one, sugar is for sweetening. Now when I talk sugar, I'm talking about um, the sweeteners in general. We talk, we can talk about sugar, but we, of course we've got honey, we've got syrups, we've got molasses, we've got all these different types of uh, sweetening agents uh, that are used for different types of things with depending on what you're baking. Now I've listed a few of them here, but whether it's extending shelf life by making a little bit higher of a sugar content or using honey as an example to give you that good eating quality for longer periods of time, or it's just to add a little bit of sugar to help you with the Maillard reaction or the coloring of the crust in the oven. Um, sugar has a number of different functions depending on what type of product that you are using it in and what your intentions for using it are. Number two, approximating measurements is okay. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not. Accurate measurements can be affected by the volume of the ingredient. You know, how much moisture is in the air? So your flowers picked up moisture. Are you using coarse sea salt, which has got a larger granular uh, size to it? Um, even the brand of ingredients can fluctuate f uh, from time to time. And, you know, it's important that, I mean, yeah, you can use these spoons and these little measuring cup things for generally pretty much okay, but it's not a very scientific way of doing it. Now, you keep in mind that measuring containers in general can vary up to as much as 20%. And this has been proven. There's, there's places out there that have done uh, tests and surveys on this stuff, 20% variation. Now, that might not mean, enough, mean very much when you just got like a half a cup or a quarter cup of this. But listen, if you're using that me the same measuring container to do five cups of, of flour, and you're wondering why your product is not looking that great like the online channel or website that you got it from, well, this could be a factor. That's why I highly recommend that you always use a digital scale. And if you wanna be more precise, weigh it in grams. It's just as simple as that. If you really wanna dial in your recipe, use grams much more accurate. Number three, salt kills yeast. Well, we know that yeast doesn't like salt. I mean, you know, but will it kill it? No. Salt will kill us also. If we're left in salt long enough, we're going to die. We're going to become dehydrated. So, accidentally getting a little bit of yeast mixed in with your salt and this and that don't panic about it you're not leaving it there for days so i'm not expecting that you will have any issues with it and there's many tests out there where people have actually mixed the two together left them there for a while and baked a loaf of bread and it's absolutely no problem yeast is a lot more resilient than we give it credit for so I recommend you check out my video here on salt. It gives you some good insights into the different types of salts and um, how it affects bread baking. Now I've heard some people say that salt doesn't really matter in baking. You know, you can bake whatever you want without salt. Just leave the salt out. Don't think too much. Just leave it out. You know, bake away. If you don't like salt, leave it out of there. Well, salt actually is an important part in the baking process. I listed a number of these items here, but keep in mind that in baking, most bake products require salt. And not just any salt, it should be sodium chloride. Once again, I highly recommend you check out my video on uh, salt and the, the new tech with respect to what's coming out as for reduced salt diets and these types of things. But remember, very difficult to bake anything that tastes really as it should or gives you the strength and stability that you need without using salt. Number five. You can't overmix white flour only breads. I mean, I've seen a number of these sites and channels that do these, this little silly experiment. And they're trying to tell you that, look, I've mixed it for 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes and 
I can still make a loaf of bread out of it. Well, let me tell you that every baking journal, every science paper, uh, every qualified, knowledgeable baker will tell you you can overmix any bread flour. The, the way it works here is that during the mixing process, your gluten strands all begin to line up like that, ultimately holding gas. Now, white flour has the highest amount of gluten uh, protein in it. And so, yeah, it can take a lot more beating. But the more you beat it and the more you work it, ultimately you will weaken it. This is scientifically proven, okay? On top of that, the longer that you mix, the temp more of a temperature increase that you've got, which can be even more detrimental to the overall finished characteristics of your product, especially if you've got a lot of yeast in there and you're making these a quick style bread. So I don't know why anybody would want to mix longer than they need to, but just keep in mind, it's always about mixing to optimum development in conjunction with optimum final dough temperature. Number six, do you need to activate dry yeast prior to using it? Well, the simple answer is no. You know, most channels, uh, video channels, baking channels, websites and all that stuff will always tell you to activate your yeast in advance with a little bit of warm water and some sugar, etc. But do you really need to? You don't. However, this is good baking practice and to activate it because what it will do is it will let you know whether your your yeast is actually working for me i hardly ever do it um i'm pretty comfortable with the yeast that i've got and i've had mine in the fridge for oh two years i decided to dump it out take it out of its sealed container put it in my freezer it's been there for another year and a half i've never had an issue with it however if you do or uh, if you do have some yeast that you're suspect of you think it's maybe dead or dying or you you know it's always good to test it by putting it in some water and some sugar and watching to see if it foams up however do you need to do this most often not number seven a pH pen is good for checking how much acid is in your dough. Now, I brought this up because there's a channel out there specifically that I'm thinking about, very popular, and he's always running around his kitchen with his pH pen. Oh, look at this, pH this, pH that, and he makes sourdough. What I am going to tell you is that the answer for this is incorrect. A pH pen will not tell you how much acid is in your sourdough. The guy who's out there and does all of his sourdough experiments, he doesn't understand any of this. pH is only a test of the strength of acid, not the quantity of acid. Water is water. I don't think about your water too much. Just put, you know, put some water. As long as you don't have a really high chlorine smell in there, yeah, just go ahead and use your water. Well, water isn't just water. Water is the second biggest, most abundant ingredient that we have in bread recipes anyway. We're talking bread here. And in most baking uh, recipes. Now, all water is different and will have different effects on the dough. You got soft water, you got hard water, you got well water with potential contaminants in it, you've got city water, you've got pHs that fluctuate all over all over the place from area to area, country to country, and even season to season. Always good to understand your water. I highly recommend you check out my video here on water. It'll help you sort all of this out. Uh, quickly and efficiently and get you on a good track for making proper bread. Any oil will do. Don't think about it too much. Just get your oil in there and, you know, start baking. Well, keep in mind that there's a number of different things that you need to consider with respect to oil. All oils are not suitable for baking. Some have very low smoke points and are not good to be putting into a product where you're going to be baking them in high temperatures. Oil, remember this, does not perform as well or as long as emulsified shortening in bread products. 
There's a lot of new healthier tech, uh, tech that's coming out there with respect to the shortenings that are available. Um, definitely recommend that you check out this video that I'm showing down here. It'll give you some insight into all of that. Oils range in fat types. Some are more healthier than others, of course. And you also have to keep in consideration the flavor um, aspects that some oils impart into your products, which may or may not be desirable. And finally, number 10, the Let's Do an Experiment uh, videos. Love these the best. Whole bunch of different stuff that they do and try to teach people about, you know, not using a stand mixer. You got to mix by hand because it's better. And bathing your sourdough to reduce acid doesn't work. Let me show you how, how why I concluded that. You know, all of these silly little conclusions are all based on a lack of knowledge. Now, even adding milk and milk products, you know, I've seen a number of sites which are doing the same experiment. And, you know, one guy, as an example, he does whole milk, skim milk, powdered milk, and say whey powder or something like that. Now, let's say he gets his best volume out of whole milk. Well, there you go. There's the conclusion of the day, man. Use whole milk. His viewers are looking at that and going, wow, whole milk. Now, another guy has got the same experiment, and his best results come from powdered milk. Oh, look at the volume I got on powder milk. All his viewers, whoa, powdered milk, that's the one he used. Listen, you know, there's a lot of different things that come into play with respect to ingredient tech, and like, like the processing, the temperature, the, the weights, uh, pan sizes. That they, uh, it goes on and on and on. So be really careful about all this stuff. If you really want to know about, serious about ingredient tech, then search beyond the YouTube stuff that's out there and start searching some technical papers. There's a lot of stuff written by universities and different types of industry um, uh, science uh, tech tech websites out there that will give you the full lowdown. Uh, and instead of listening to information that is um, mediocre to totally out to lunch. Thank you very much for watching the video. I hope you learned a little bit of something out of this one. I always try to give a little bit of information in there that's a little different from some of the other websites. But if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to drop me a line. I'd be happy to answer any of your baking questions. And remember, please give me a like and a subscribe uh, down below. It really, really helps with this YouTube stuff and especially when you're starting off like I am. So uh, thank you, we'll see you again next time on No BS Baking.